Hi everybody, Dr. Batash here. Uh, this is the second episode of our Be Well podcast. And tonight we are honored to have uh, as our guest my uh, very long time and good friend, the world renowned gynecologist and pelvic cosmetic surgeon, Dr. Yaakov Levy. Yaakov, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. It's really wonderful, wonderful to have you here. Dr. Patash, I'm really, really pleased and honored to be here on this podcast and uh, uh, to discuss very interesting uh, topic of hormone replacement uh, relating to the weight uh, and hormone replacement as more wider issue of all ages, you know, young age, perimenopausal, postmenopausal, and for men and how it relates not only to weight, also to well-being, to age well, to um, managing your activities of daily life better as you age. I love it. Let's do it. So, Jakob, let's start with the first question. What is the meaning of a pelvic cosmetic surgeon? Please explain that to our audience. Pelvic cosmetic surgeon. So, uh, obviously, I'm an OBGYN, so I've been doing um, pelvic surgery and obstetric and gynecologic uh, surgeries. Pelvic cosmetic surgery, it's focusing on pelvis. It's a reconstruction, restoration of the pelvic anatomy for the women as they go through aging, as they go through the um, uh, childbirth, because it changes their anatomy, it uh, changes the pelvis, and um, that reflects on how they function, how they feel, that includes uh, their sexual performance, how they look and how they feel about themselves, and that includes urinary incontinence. So the cosmetic surgery partially functionally restores their uh, function, sexual mm -hmm. function mm -hmm. or the urinary function. And second most important thing, uh, their cosmetic appearance. Mm -hmm. That could be genetic, that could be acquired with the childbearing or aging because they change with the hormonal changes, the labia and appearance changes, the color changes, and we can do the plastic surgery for labia or the, for the vagina and the uh, uh, pelvis to restore and make it more aesthetically pleasant looking for the woman, whatever their perception uh, might be. So we don't, uh, there is no standards for aesthetics or cosmetics, it's all uh, in their eyes. So beauty in the eye of the beholder. So whatever they perceive, perceive that is good looking for them, that's what we will mm -hmm. restore. That could be a surgical, that could be energy-based devices, would be a laser or fractional plasma, or that could be injections that includes the orgasm enhancing shots, uh, using PRP or exosomes to uh, improve the healing, restore the function. So I like what you just touched on, orgasm enhancing shots. Yes. So uh, if we could start with that, because I find that interesting, and I think many in our audience would find that interesting, and if perhaps in addition to that, you could uh, tell us uh, briefly about two or three of your most favorite or most effective uh, procedures uh, when it comes to restoring the function, uh, the appearance of the female pelvis. So your favorite stuff. But start with the orgasm. Uh, enhancement. We'll start. Yes. We'll start. We'll start orgasm because everybody wants to. Yes, everyone wants orgasm, a good orgasm. Everybody needs some help. Well, not everybody. So to some degree, it depends how you perceive. Uh, so orgasm has been shot. The simplest way to approach that is uh, stimulating and enhancing the sensitivity of nerve endings around the clitoris and vaginal area, so-called famous G-spot, mm -hmm. uh, or around it. Uh, now with age, or some people even genetically from younger age, they have decreased sensitivity and uh, they have orgasmic dysfunction. So they either ha have a hard time to achieving orgasm or the other phases of the sexual um, uh, satisfaction that will be the arousal or... Um, um, but orgasm dysfunction we can stimulate uh, by multiple modalities. So there could be a vaginal laser mm -hmm. resurfacing, there could be a vaginal radio frequency stimulation, there could be electromagnetic stimulation of vaginal area, but the most powerful probably in the single shot treatment, like in one session. You know, all those others require multiple sessions, prolonged treatment. It's not bad, it's very good because it's a good physiologic rehabilitation treatment because you're recovering your function. You're turning your aging clock 
backwards. Mm -hmm. So aging continues, so you do it once, and it's not one time you did and that's it, you don't have to go back. You know, you continue aging, and after a while you do it again, so you maintain that function. But I'm gonna go back to that one single most effective treatment will be probably orgasm enhancement uh, injection. Mm -hmm. That would be injection of the plasma, platelet-rich plasma, mm -hmm. uh, or exosomes. What do you mean by that, if you could just describe it? So platelet-rich, probably everybody, pro most of the people probably know people use it for so many indications. That would be a facial cosmetics to <clears throat> as a fillers or as a stimulating also for hair growth. It's a blood. Uh, we take blood, uh, we extract um, uh, platelet-rich, create a platelet-rich plasma because platelets contain a lot of growth factors and a lot of immune modulators. Uh, and that PRP then we inject in a specific areas around the vagina, around the urethra, around the clitoris. So that shot can be modified that not only it will improve your orgasm, also it will improve your sexual, I mean, uh, urinary continence. Mm -hmm. So we can relieve your urinary incontinence. A lot of women with age beginning to have urinary incontinence. Mm -hmm. With childbearing, aging, they lose collagen, they lose uh, blood supply to the uh, urethra, bladder, neck, and vaginal walls. And that leads to prolapse, descend, and that leads to urinary incontinence uh, because bladder falls out of the abdominal pressure controlling its closure. So whenever, what that means, urinary incontinence, for most of the people we say, to explain, it's when they cough, sneeze, go to gym, jump, do any physical exercise, or even sometimes with sex, they leak urine. And that limits their daily activities. So they're afraid to go to gym, they have to wear the pad, some of them are afraid to perform the sex because they might lose urine at the time. And that's a big uh, uh, detriment to their quality of uh, life and it's easily treatable mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning of uh, beginning stages with those injections or some uh, devices. Is this uh, similar to or is this somewhat different or is it complementary to uh, uh, the female Viagra, which you're describing? Female Viagra is, are you talking about pill? So or, I know that that's a pill that essentially pill. is an antidepressant. Does what you do with your orgasmic enhancement, would that enhance that pill, that female Viagra? Is it very different? Radically different. Okay. So this is radically different because the female Viagra is uh, uh, formulated to increase the circulation around the clitoral area. So it vasodilates. And carries is it a also a mood enhancer? Um, a very weak mood enhancer. It mm -hmm. does not psychologically motivate them, so it does mm -hmm. not increase their libido or sexual drive. Mm, uh, it's uh, formulated to increase the circulation there uh, and carry significant risk factors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. High blood pressure, headaches. Uh, so honestly, I have not used it in my practice. Mm -hmm. I have not had anybody request it or I have not prescribed this medication because of the significant side effect profile. Once I describe to them side effect profile, nobody wants to take it. For females, it's a different story for males. Mm -hmm. uh, now what does the injections do with the PRP or stem cells or the uh, exosomes or even autologous fat? We can suction your own fat, that's autologous fat, using your own fat, process it to nano fat and inject it back mm -hmm. to that specific um, arousal areas to increase your orgasm. I've had women who even said that they've never experienced orgasm mm -hmm. in their life and they mm -hmm. thought it doesn't exist and this was the first time they experienced it. So that's how powerful, uh, powerful is it. Mechanism of, of action is different. It actually regenerates the uh -huh. nerve endings uh -huh. on top of increasing the circulation. It's a regenerative treatment. It actually regenerates the tissues in that area the, and improves the circulation around the mucosa. Mm -hmm. So it also improves the dryness. So a lot of women have a dryness, mm -hmm. especially with menopause. So it relieves the dryness, relieves that uh, uh, decreased uh, sexual function. So they okay. do feel that's a significant improvement when you relieve the dryness. So uh, what you just described to me is very, very interesting. I was not aware that this existed. It and does. I'm sure that this will pique uh, the interest of many, many women in our audience. Uh, uh, this almost sounds magical. This almost sounds like you're turning the clock back on your youth. And as you said, for some women who've never experienced orgasm, uh, this is eye-opening. It's all of a sudden uh, you're just reborn. 
It is amazing. Because it is an essential part of life. life. Yes, because if you wake up in the morning and you had a full night and you had an orgasm and you had a good sexual life, you go on with your life really so satisfied all day. Everything goes well, you're energetic, you're positive. And you walk around with that satisfied look. Self, self um, image of um, uh, self-confidence, it's very important. You feel confident, you know, you feel uh, you're able to accomplish that. So it gives you a lot of self-confidence. Same way, you know, some people would say that uh, who cares about the labial appearance, you know, who is looking at it. But it's not about who looks at it and decides that someone has a beautiful looking labia or not. But it's about women themselves because they feel uh, confident. confident. They feel more confident. So when you have inner confidence, it shows throughout your actions, throughout your decision making process and everything. So it almost starts you off the right foot to achieve totally unrelated goals to that. Because unrelated to your, in your job, um, uh, finances or relationships, so it completely changes your life. And it's kind of taboo, not many people dis discuss it, media doesn't discuss it, nobody's going to say it on the TV. Most of the women are uh, kind of uh, shy to bring it up to the conversation with the doctors. Sometimes I even have to question them uh, pretty you know, extensively to pull that information out of them. Uh, and they have to feel comfortable with you. Like these are women that have uh, been my patients for uh, some of them uh, almost 20 years. You know, oh. they are they are twin. They are young girls are my patients now. The, the babies that I delivered. Mm -hmm. uh, so they feel a little much more comfortable bringing up to me that from the beginning of the conversation. But if you just meet someone, you do have to do some extensive questioning. Uh, you know, not even talking about discussing it openly with friends or the media. So that's why it's kind of left out, and not many people knows. Mm -hmm. that it is available and it does have a good function. When I started using that many years ago, I also was skeptical. I was thinking, you know, it cannot be so good, you know, it's too good to be true. And then with years of using and using and using, I see the result and I gain my self-confidence because from the positive results and the feedbacks of uh, women. So now I know that I'm doing something good. So. That's really, really interesting, and I uh, learned something new today, but thank you. It does, it's right. And, you know, whether it's a man or a woman, when one of us uh, is more satisfied with life, when you have that extra step, when you have uh, that satisfaction in you, you have that extra glow to you, whether yes. you're a man or a woman. And very frequently you can see that in people. You can actually see in how always, they always in most of the patients. Like I see sometimes, same patient comes and they have this glow, and then I know there's something positive going on Absolutely. in their life. And uh, most of the time, it's a relationship related, personal related. Uh, you don't see that much glow when they have a job achievements or financial achievements. No, that's right. so that inner self confidence always speaks through. So, Yaakov, uh, the next. Um, question that I want to ask you is the following. So we've been doing uh, endoscopic, non-invasive, non-surgical weight loss um, for many years now. And uh, the one thing that's become very obvious to me is that overwhelmingly, uh, by a margin of about a, uh, 80, 85, maybe even 90%, of the patients that we treat, they're overwhelmingly women. Of course, we have male patients as well, but the overwhelming majority of patients that we treat are women. Um, so I guess what I'd like to ask you is, why do you think that weight management, uh, weight gain, weight loss, is uh, so much more complicated, so much, more, uh, so much harder for women than it is for men. What are your thoughts? Uh, I would say it's a um, multifactorial. So that, yes, I have to agree, and, uh, managing weight is a little bit harder in women than in men. A lot. A lot yeah. harder, yes. Uh, and you can probably break it up in few different uh, groups, few different uh, factors. One would be the age, uh, hormones, 
uh, and uh, pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. the pre-existing conditions that are more common to women than in men. Uh, age changes which are a little bit more drastic, uh, reflected, drastically reflected on women than in men. Um, uh, uh, so let's start with uh, pre-existing conditions that predispose women to more weight gain. Very common condition like PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. We have a lot of women. A lot of women. Eat. It's many of them have PCOS. A lot many of them th have issues with infertility, with conceiving. That's next uh, thing that we also next uh, function that we take care of in our office. But we'll leave it for next podcast. Uh, the fertility sure, uh, reflection sure, on the weight. But talking about PCOS, it's very common. Uh, most PCOS is they have um, inherent. Uh, uh, affinity for weight gain uh, because they are insulin resistant uh, because they um, uh, also insulin resistant they accumulate the fat their hormones uh, they have high DHS which is uh, not a pure testosterone uh, compared to uh, natural testosterone that one does not boost their metabolism so opposite their metabolism is lower mm -hmm. so Slow metabolism, insulin resistance is key factor of gaining the weight. It's very hard for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. The other thing that also is nobody knows which one came first, egg or a chicken, because is it a hormone disbalance mm -hmm. or genetic predisposition um, for those women that predispose them from accumulation of the uh, weight, but the fat itself then triggers the opposite reaction. It converts that testosterone to estrogen, they have a high estrogen, which also stimulates their appetite, which is also stimulates the insulin, and then you end up with even more. So it's like a vicious cycle for them to lose the weight. So the key treatment for them would be to put them on the medications like a metformin to block the testosterone, metformin to increase the insulin uh, receptor sensitivity, so help them to uh, lose weight aggressive. Uh, exercise, aggressive exercise, and by any means getting rid of fat. Mm -hmm. Simply by reducing the volume of the fat, you're reducing their hormonal load. So if you do your procedures and reduce their fat, you reduce their estrogen load, and that kind of breaks their vicious cycle too. So it's a big help too. Mm -hmm. So you have to approach them by exercise, by uh, metformin, uh, spironolactone if needed, like a testosterone blockers that uh, uh, blocks the um, uh, aromatization uh, and add to that um, mechanical fat removal, whether it's going to be a liposuction or um, abdominoplasty, but even more importantly, to lose weight physiologically by doing the procedures that you're doing, that gastric sleeve endoscopic that uh, blocks the absorption of the uh, nutrients and uh, produces the artificial satiety, right? Did I say it correctly? Well, yeah, so, artificially so, fills them, so, so they don't eat it, they right. lose so weight. So essentially what our procedure does is uh, we uh, decrease the size of the reservoir by shortening and narrowing the stomach. So we decrease the size of the reservoir by 70 to 80%, number one. Uh, and number two, we delay the gastric emptying of food. So food, instead of sitting in your stomach for 30 to 60 minutes, literally sits there for six to seven hours, thereby suppressing your appetite. So the typical patient that does one of our procedures, uh, let's say the suture sculpt, uh, she will say, you know, before the procedure, I needed 20, 25 bites to feel full. Now I'm full after four or five bites, and then I'm not hungry for six or seven hours. Yeah, that's amazing. That's yeah. how they lose weight. And by losing the weight, you're reducing the fat, you're reducing the estrogen load. So hence, you're reducing the DEHS load, and that's unwanted hormones. Mm -hmm. And we don't want that much hormones. I mean, that leads to a whole line of other problems, endometrial cancer and everything. But key point is that they're going to lose weight. Mm -hmm. So it it's, uh, kind of triggers the right chain reaction. Uh, in PCOS women. So this is one pre-existing condition that okay. they have. Uh, besides the genetically predisp mm -hmm. genetic predisposition mm -hmm. to uh, uh, high weight, then we go to the age-related hormonal changes. Women go through the cyclic changes every month. 
women don't go through that. So their hormones are going up and down. So they're psychologically and hormonally are a little bit difficult to manage their weight because you have to approach them uh, correctly. So all these hormones, they have this hormonal surge that increases their uh, appetite, weight retention, water retention, uh, increasing progesterone and uh, estrogen. So they're more prone for weight gain than men are. Men have pretty stable hormonal life throughout the life because we don't have a drastic events. Um, and that we go to men equivalent of menopause, you know, after age 40, 50, with the decline of testosterone. But we don't have like women have, you know, age 51 average United States drastic drop of hormones. We gradually lose the hormones, you know, one to three percent every year. Women drastically, their ovaries go cold turkey at menopause, so they completely stop producing progesterone zero. Testosterone decreases drastically. Estrogen obviously goes to zero. So they have a, another major life event that is programmed in their genes that slows their metabolism because they lose testosterone and prones them to weight gain. So it's harder for women to lose weight after menopause because their metabolism is so, uh, so much slower compared to premenopausal uh, stage. And I miss the one drastic event that women go through before menopause is a childbearing. So they go to, even if they have a one child or two child, each event is, a, is an insult to their body because they have a, their hormone levels go few hundred times. So if your normal estrogen levels are 50, 70 range, when you're pregnant they are in a 500, 600 range, even higher range. Same goes with the progesterone, same goes with the, for the testosterone. So that obviously affects their metabolism. They retain the weight and they have to lose afterwards. So it's a significant work for them to lose that weight that stretches the skin, creates the body contour, disform, uh, you know, uh, disforms the body. And, they, and some of them never go back to 100% to the beginning point, some of them. A lot of women will go back to. So all these events makes much more difficult to manage their weight. And what you're describing really uh, mimics what I see in my practice. Um, so I will have a segment of young women uh, who, you know, we have uh, 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 adolescents as young as 16 that we take care of. So uh, let's say that group of 16 through early 20s, and they have issues with weight. Uh, then the next group of women that comes in is uh, women that have had one, two, three, four children. And they say to me that with each pregnancy, it becomes harder and harder to lose the weight. Uh, and then, of course, the third group is around that perimenopausal or menopausal age when essentially they tell me that when it comes to weight gain, they literally drop off the cliff. And this is exactly what uh, you are describing. One interesting thing we're leaving out is, or two maybe, uh, would be education level and the knowledge. A lot of people simply don't have an access or desire to obtain the, uh, the knowledge about the right uh, diet, right activity, or cultural uh, you know, background. Uh, their feeding uh, culture or the food culture that they don't have a complete understanding of what they are eating and how negatively it affects them. This one, and by the time they learn all that and educate themselves and they're ready to put all the effort to lose the weight, they already hit the menopause. Now it's very hard for them. Now the nature works against them. So that's when they need the help hormonally when they'll hit the menopause and they need an aggressive help when they are young and childbearing age to do the procedures like you do mm -hmm. uh, and the diet monitoring and exercise and activities at that stage. Once they get to menopausal stage, they still benefit from the procedures that you Absolutely. do. Yeah, still Absolutely. benefit from diet and exercise, but that will not help them completely if you don't don't get involved in the hormones so, because then hormones becomes more important. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you. I have so many women uh, who tell me, doctor, I don't really eat that much. Yeah. I really control my portions. Uh, I eat very little or I'll only eat once a day uh, and I exercise uh, and I still can't seem to lose the weight. Uh, and the point that I try to make is 
while every one of the factors that I just mentioned is very important, uh, the bottom line is when it comes to weight loss, the amount of energy that you burn has to exceed more than you take in. Yeah. And if you follow that equation, you will lose weight. And if you don't follow that equation, you will not lose that weight. And that's why it's important to underscore that it's not just how much you eat, how big your portions are, but all the other things that you mentioned, the hormone levels uh, uh, and the genetic predisposition, that all plays a role. But um, when you intervene with our endoscopic procedure, such as the suture sculpt, uh, you know, uh, you, you give the patient that push to be able to overcome these negative factors and to lose weight. So Yaakov, I have a question for you. Women are women. They have estrogen and progesterone. What do you mean? Women make testosterone? Please help me understand. They do. They do, believe it or not. They, oh, everybody I thinks that uh, uh, t uh, t everybody thinks testosterone is a male hormone. Male hormone. It's a myth that we need to debunk. Testosterone is not only male hormone, and everybody believes that testosterone is only for sexual drive. No, testosterone is an extremely important hormone for both men and women, uh, and um, it performs so many functions that uh, most of the people. Uh, I would say not only people, that a lot of doctors uh, have a limited um, knowledge in a testosterone function and uh, importance uh, in women or men's uh, life. So yes, do women make testosterone? And Where actually, is it made in women? Yeah, they make more testosterone than estrogen, right? Strange, right? So women makes more testosterone than estrogen, actually. Mm -hmm. And they have uh, three areas. They make, uh, their ovaries make testosterone. Adrenals make testosterone, and then peripherally, their fat converts. So they also have a, there is a peripheral conversion of um, uh, testa estrogen into testosterone. So they do have a three major sources of uh, testosterone that is fluctuating throughout the life, and their uh, function of testosterone is very important for women. It's not only sexual arousal, desire, and the libido, but it modulates their mood, anxiety, and depression. Testosterone plays a major role. Immune modulator, um, bone protector, brain function and cognitive function protection, cardiovascular function. I mean, testosterone, there are uh, hundreds of studies showing that uh, testosterone levels are correlating with the risk of heart attacks or risk of strokes or the recovery from those events. So a normal or high testosterone levels correlate to lower risk of heart attacks, lower risk of strokes, uh, in men and in women on both, and much better cognitive function, protection of cognitive de decline with age, uh, and Alzheimer's risk is much lower, for example, 80% lower in men with a normal or high testosterone, and in women about 50% lower. So it's a significant, significant hormone that when it declines, we lose the protective function on bones, brain, heart, mood, immune system, not even talking about the sexual function. I'm talking about sexual arousal, uh, erection and performance for men, uh, libido for women. Uh, also, I forgot to tell you, muscle wasting. So the cleaning testosterone leads to muscle wasting. So they cannot build up muscle mass anymore. Weight gain, testosterone uh, levels correlate to metabolism. So it, when the t testosterone goes down for women, their metabolism slows down they gain weight. That's what happens with menopause. They lose testosterone. So with menopause, both we, men and women, lose testosterone with age. So if we take women between ages 20 and 40, they lose 50% of their testosterone production from adrenals. Uh, Yaakov, so um, let's say uh, a woman uh, either in her late 40s or let's say early 50s, um, the perimenopausal age, and then they hit menopause. Uh, and as you've described very convincingly, a woman's testosterone levels decrease. Uh, obviously, her levels of estrogen and progesterone go to zero because the ovarian function ceases because uh, those ovaries no longer produce uh, any eggs. Um, and then the question that comes up is, 
hormone replacement therapy to somehow uh, battle uh, or try to uh, put up some kind of a defense against the aging process. So some women just uh, accept those changes and they don't do anything about it. Some uh, women are, have the desire to use hormone replacement therapy. But then there are a lot of fears with hormone replacement therapy. Can it give me, can it increase my chances of getting breast cancer or uh, endometrial cancer? Um, could you address some of those issues? Should every woman receive hormone replacement therapy? Should they just say, no, this is what God wanted for me. Therefore, this is part of life. Uh, what's your approach? What do you tell your female patients? So it's very <clears throat> two-pronged question. Medicine and philosophical, like uh, you involve the God, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we are genetically programmed to lose testosterone and lose hormones as we age. And not only genetics, also environmental factors, right? Some people lose faster, some people lose slower, despite, regardless of what their genetics uh, predisposes them and that uh, because of the factors they are exposed to or the type of food they eat or activity they have that affects your hormone production. Uh, but overall, genetically and environmentally, we are losing those uh, hormones. Yes, kind of God made us that way and that's meant to be that way, but at the same time, God gave us a very powerful computer, very powerful brain <laughs> and gave us a free will and told us that, hey, use it to your fullest abilities. And if we can make aging a pleasant experience, why shouldn't we do it? So we are not going to stop aging by replacing hormones, but we can age well. Like, we are not going to feel bad when we are 60. We can make you feel like 30, even though you are 60. I would so, take that. So you, but I'm not going to stop you from aging but you're gonna age well. So that's a big difference between anti-aging and aging well. Mm -hmm. So anti-aging is a different battle, but uh, aging well is a totally different thing. So aging well, you're accepting your genetics, you're accepting God-given uh, flow of the sequence, but you want to do it well. You want to be able to play soccer with your grandkids when you're you 70. Age you want more to gracefully. Age gracefully, age well. Uh, continue performing your beloved functions without compromising. I'm talking about performing sexually, being Maybe active. Maybe not five times a day, but perhaps five three times, times a, a day, month. Three times a day. <laughs> <laughs> but perform all these functions that makes you feel you, makes you feel good, makes you feel positive. And when you approach that age that you know, you're ready to leave this world, you're going to feel good about it. So you're not going to have that last 20, 30, 50 years of your life uh, miserable. So you're going to feel good. And it's possible. And it's possible. Now, question of the fears and the myths that people have for men and women, right? They all have a few major myths that estrogen increases the breast cancer, estrogen increases the cardiovascular risk, and um, venous thrombolic events, which in lay language would be blood clots and hitting the heart or the brain and causing the stroke. Uh, there was a famous study that World Health Organization did, what is it now, 20-some years ago, right? More than 25, 27 years ago, uh, like the end of 90s, and they uh, used the conjugated equine estrogen and medroxyprogesterone. These are two synthetic estrogens and progesterones for their study to determine the effects of the estrogen repl hormone replacement on uh, women, and they came up with a very uh, rushed conclusion that it increases the breast cancer risk and cardiovascular events. Now that has been debunked, but it was too late, too little. Debunked 20 years later, like 2017, there was a Many major study. Many people still are not aware that it's been aware. Not only people, doctors are not aware of that fact, and they're still operating on the old premise that hormone replacement is bad. Debunked in a two different uh, subsets. One, that a longer follow-up on that woman 18-year follow-up showed that estrogen does not increase the breast cancer nor decreases the breast cancer. Same goes with the progesterone. What does is medroxyprogesterone and conjugated synthetic estrogen. Progesterone is a major culprit there. 
actual that new studies conclusion is opposite. Pure estradiol and compounded micronized progesterone is actually good and protective for breast cancer. We can say that it is, and that's what bioidentical hormones are. They are pure estradiol, plant-derived, not animal-derived, not synthetic, pure plant-derived bioidentical hormones. A big difference because estron and estriol that are in synthetic estrogens are completely different from natural estradiol mm -hmm. uh, molecule. Same goes for testosterone. Testosterone cyprionate or synthetic testosterone is completely different from natural bioidentical testosterone, which is identical to the testosterone molecule. And that molecule difference makes the big difference in side effects and the positive effects. Now, so having said that, we debunk the myth that it's problematic for breast cancer. It doesn't, pure estrogen. Again, we have to draw the mm -hmm. distinction. Pro progestins and medroxyprogesterone, synthetic progesterone and synthetic estrogens, not so good. They will help you with symptoms. Even they're better than nothing because they will help you with symptoms. The hot flushes, low energy, sexual drive, they will help you with that. that they will, that, but they will lack the health benefits of natural hormones mm -hmm. <clears throat> and protective effects. On the other hand, uh, if we go to testosterone, has its myths also, perception that it increases the prostate cancer. It increases the blood clotting. It increases the cardiovascular events and the heart attacks, which is partially true for testosterone cyprianate. That has an effect of uh, blocking thromboxan 2. So increasing the, uh, increasing the uh, platelet aggregation and also vasoconstriction. That leads to the fact that testosterone injections that a lot of bodybuilders and men do um, increases their risk of blood clots and heart attacks and the strokes, which is 100% different from bioidentical natural testosterone. Again, natural testosterone molecule is completely different from testosterone, synthetic testosterone. And natural testosterone does not affect the thromboxan, the thromboxan production by platelets, does not affect the platelet aggregation, does not have a vasoconstrictive effect. It has opposite vasodilating effect. So it gives you that cardioprotective, brain protective, anti-stroke effect. So it has a positive effect. So it's not true for the natural bioidentical testosterone that or that heart attacks. Now, as far as the prostate cancer goes, same, it's protective. It's protective. Testosterone is protective prostate cancer. We wouldn't give testosterone who has a PSA of over 2.5. We wouldn't replace it with testosterone. But anybody under 2.5, yes. And it does protect you from prostate cancer. But and the breast cancer, too. By the way, testosterone is anti-breast cancer function. Mm -hmm. One of the, some of the breast cancer uh, subsets are treated by testosterone and testosterone analogs. So it will have a protective function for the breast cancer, too. When it comes to PSA, just briefly uh, commented on it. So uh, PSA is a function of age, and in a 20-year-old boy, the PSA number is going to be very low. But as men age, uh, let's say a 50 or 60 or 70-year-old man, the pros their PSA levels are going to go up, uh, and that's age-related, and that would not be as, let's say, alarming Let's say a PSA level of four or five or even six in a 70-year-old man is not that alarming, and that person probably will not have prostate cancer, but if we had that level in a 20-year-old boy, that would be very alarming. So you would not use it in a man who, let's say, is 70 and has an age-appropriate PSA level of five. Age-appropriate is a key Correct. point. Correct. Age-appropriate. Age-appropriate is a key point. Again, PSA should remain normal under 3.5 even though with age it increases. So if somebody comes and she, he's 70 and he wants to have a hormone replacement and I test and his PSA is four or five, so it's a little bit higher than normal. So I would need uh, to do the urologic workup. He needs to go to urologist, mm -hmm. have a prostate tested on the presence of prostate cancer. And if the urologist clears him, then it's okay. he would be comfortable. Then it's okay. Even, even for women who have a breast cancer, or even for the men who have a prostate cancer documented, but they underwent treatment, 
they received whatever, the radiation, chemotherapy, surgical therapy, and they are one year out of their respective cancer therapy, it's okay to it's give them hormone. It's okay to give them hormone. Again, we'll be a little worried and anxious and working with oncologists. This is not our top choice of the patient that we want to jump in and loading them with the hormones, but that just shows that it is safe and it is doable. And those women, people also deserve to have a... So, Yakov, I have a question for you. So, um, let's say we have a woman who's uh, in her early 50s and clearly uh, she, has pa she has had her menopause. So, I have two questions. One, you're fully um, on board with replacing her uh, female hormones, if you could address that, number one. And number two... Does she also need supplementation with testosterone? If you could comment on those two separate questions. They are very connected. And I apologize for interrupting you, but what the hell is pellet therapy? A lot pellet of therapy. patients are asking about that. Please, please we'll go explain that, it to us. We'll go to that too. Okay. Uh, so let's say, what are we going to do with a woman who has menopause? So what is menopause? Menopause is when they stop having periods, menstrual cycles for one year. Mm -hmm. So once the woman has no periods for one year, that's a menopause. Age group 45 to 55 is average okay. being 51 in the United States. The other way of menopause is FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, 23 or above. I mean, there's a little by variation definition, by definition, right, menopause. Now, I'm not going to go into details because right, some women have a high FSA but no, still, yeah. have a, still have a period. But, but, they're, 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 right. but the general purpose, because there's a lot of details. That we, but a woman comes, she's 50, 51, 45, 48, uh, no, no periods for a year. Should we automatically replace? Uh, two key factors. Number one, is, this, is she symptomatic? So she, is she experiencing symptoms of menopause? So and there's a, the answer is yes. Right, so, and there are multiple symptoms. So there would be a hot flushes, night sweats, uh, low sexual drive, low libido, vaginal dryness, sexual discomfort and pain with sex, anxiety, uh, weight, weight gains, anxiety, depression, um, depression, also memory. We didn't address that memory changes with age in men and women, um, brain fox, memory, mental clarity, focus, declines, it's testosterone, attributed to the testosterone. So if all that present, dry skin, hair thinning, and she's willing to take the hormones, meaning she wants to live a normal life, she wants to feel normal, absolutely, we would give them an estrogen. Anybody who has no period should have an estrogen. So, once so the, estrogen patch, estrogen pills. That's the key point. You see, I'm a big proponent of natural estrogen. Now, estrogen patch, estrogen pills, estrogen creams or estrogen uh, vaginal rings, right? It's a transdermal estrogen is safer than oral estrogen. Mm -hmm. So it carries less risk of blood clotting, less cardiovascular risk uh, than transdermal estrogen. Even less risk for bioidentical, natural, plant-derived estrogen. So most of the prescribed pills or transdermal Estrogens will be synthetic. Those are synthetic. The only few are like a Vival. I don't want to go into brand names, but I can name a few that, um, that I'm not promoting any of those brands, but there are few that are still uh, plant derived. And there are preferred formularies for the estrogen replacement. But by far, 90% will be synthetic, meaning they will give you some symptomatic relief without the long term benefits of estrogen replacement. Testosterone, should we give this woman testosterone? Absolutely. I would give testosterone to my mom, to my sister, to my wife, uh, because it's very important. It's very protective. It's both combination of estrogen and testosterone that's regenerative, that brings your youth, brings your energy. So increased energy, you sleep better, you recover your energy better, your memory improves, sexual drive improves, libido improves. Dry skin goes away, vaginal dryness goes away, sexual discomfort goes away, uh, focus, mental clarity gets better, metabolism increases. So you're energetic, you can exercise, you can regain your muscle mass, and you can lose uh, fat. So how can you say no to that? 
Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. Now, when is it important to give first 10 years of menopause is crucial because most of the destructive function of hormone loss appears first five years, first 10 years. So biggest like a bang for your back, spend a dollar, you're going to get it if you introduce this in the first 10 years of menopause. Mm -hmm. Because that's when you prevent most of the destructive function, osteoporosis, cardiovascular risk increase, uh, brain uh, deterioration, uh, immune system, mood stabilization, vaginal, um, why that sex also gets painful because it's dry, it loses the uh, mucosa vascularization in that area. So all that first 10 years happens drastically. Are women going to get grow, start growing facial hair? Uh, are they, uh, you know, are they going to have the same symptoms of PCOS if you give them a lot of testosterone? No, that's different. Different, how? different, different, different. And how do you administer testosterone? Do you, do you give them patches? Do you give them injections? That's the thing. So, uh, estrogen, we're pretty, you know, multiple ways of administering estrogen, right? You can do oral patch, cream, vaginal, no. and bioidentical. We're going to talk about bioidentical administration. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite because the most natural, most... Uh, uh, least problematic, least side effect, and most long-term health benefits. Same thing for testosterone. Testosterone, you can give the creams, injections. There is no oral testosterone. It's not absorbed. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the bioidentical testosterone, which is in the form of a, a palace. That's the way to administer the testosterone. Now, why the hormone replacement doesn't produce those effects that was happening in a young uh, uh, age? So in young age, PCOS symptoms were pr produced by aromatization of these hormones. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a DHT, there, there was a DHES. That was what's producing all this hair because mm -hmm. aromatized testosterone, that's what produces the hair growth. So they're not going to grow mustaches? No, a very minimal risk of centrally located increased hair possible, very low percentage, less than 1% risk mm -hmm. of bioidentical testosterone if you give them which very easy. This is women who are aromatas, aromatizing, and we can block them easy. We can give them spironolactone, we can give them a finasteride, and um, it stops. Uh, or a little bit of acne. But again, that's extremely minimal. Mm -hmm. I haven't had anybody complaining of that. Okay. But it's theoretically, uh, theoretically possible. And uh, there was, not, what was the other portion of what the What is pellet therapy? Pellet therapy. Pellets. A couple of patients asked me about it, and uh, I didn't know anything, so I had to do some reading, and I was fascinated by it. Pellets are an interesting thing. Um, believe it or not, it's been a long time, almost 60, 70 years since bioidentical testosterone and estrogen has been introduced in 1939 and 40s, and it was favorite method of hormone replacement in 40s and 50s until, until Big Pharma produced synthetic estrogen. And then the game changed. Everybody pushed synthetic estrogen because it was produced by the pharmacological companies and um, it was uh, promoted. And everybody forgot about plant-derived estrogen and testosterone. And they pushed back. And now it's revived. It's coming back. whole world is using them. In Australia, it's a predominant form of hormone uh, replacement. So we are trying to use it and go back to that. So pellets, going back to How that. do you do it? Pellets Is it an are, invasive procedure? Yeah, it is a little bit invasive. So pellets are compressed hormones, compressed powder. So if you take the powder and compress under the pressure, you create a little pellet. It's like a little pellet of, uh, if you take a matchstick. It's and like a little piece, zip drive. Smaller than that. If you, <laughs> if you imagine the matchstick okay. and you cut it like a uh, one third of inch long or quarter inch long or even smaller, and about two millimeters wide. So it's extremely, extremely small compressed hormone. The only difference between pellet and, um, uh, for example, creams and other ways of delivery, that there is no third components, tertiary components that are holding this hormone. Nothing holds it together. It's a pure pressure, compressed and sterilized with EBM. So it's sterilized in a way that doesn't require no autoclaving, no traditional ways. So it's placed under the skin and it's a pure hormone, nothing else. And the way it's made, it's made from yams, both estrogen and testosterone, uh, that even the components of yam is not present there. So if you're allergic to yams, we can still give it to you. What are yams? It's like a potato, it's a fruit, it's a vegetable. Oh, okay. Yams. <laughs> oh, okay. Yams. 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 Okay. So, 
they extract from that mm -hmm. and it's pure plant derived bioidentical hormones mm -hmm. in a palate form and it's placed under the skin i mean there's many ways of putting mm -hmm. under skin mm -hmm. the most preferred by me method would be um in the hip area okay above the buttock that at least uh, you know touched or at least um, uh, uh, traumatized area right, right. Uh, and uh, it's good for four months for women mm -hmm. and six months for men compared to taking a pill every day so it's like a sustained release kind of a therapy it's a sustained release it's not delayed release or slow release it's absorbed by the circulation and the, uh, pretty much depends on the cardiac output of the, on the patient mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to delayed release capsules or delayed release medications have something that holds the hormone in it. So there is a third component or even fourth and fifth and many other chemicals that are hold that medium that holds the active ingredient. Here, there's nothing like that. We put it inside the fat and the circulation of the blood slowly, slowly takes the hormone and it gives you a very steady state instead of fluctuations of like an injectable or the cream or the pills, it gives you a constantly steady state of hormone much better way of administering the hormones. And you're saying that this minimizes the, the risks of these hormones because of the delivery system? No, delivery system delivers a steady state. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't give you the peaks and uh, troughs, uh, ups and downs. So the symptomatically they are stable, so they don't feel high and low. Mm -hmm. on the hormones like when men give you themselves the testosterone injections they do it once a week or twice a week so in two three days after injection they feel like they need the shot so they mm -hmm. feel all these ups and downs with this one once we place it for four months they feel same mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at the end of the four months we put the new one because the old one is gone it's right. completely right. Right. completely absorbed and there's nothing left from that because it was a pure hormone that becomes part of the body it goes into the body and disappears so what do you really recommend for most women uh, who are either peri or postmenopausal? So do they all get hormone replacement therapy or not? What is your advice? Good or what should I tell my relatives? Good, good, good question. You know, uh, hormone replacement, I call it a hormone optimization because we okay. want to optimize the level I of like hormones okay. because hormone replacement, you're like mechanically replacing the levels of the hormones. Uh, disregarding the actual symptoms or the need why you're replacing them. Hormone optimization, we are delivering the hormones based on their symptoms and based on their levels. Uh, so it's a little bit more uh, healthy way of okay. treating, treating them. Number one, there is no age limit. Mm -hmm. So I have as young as 32 and as old as 81 for hormone replacement. Now, does it mean that they all get the same benefits? No. So within the first 10 years of menopause, they get the most benefits. I'm talking about uh, long-term health care benefits. That's the bone protection, brain protection, cardiovascular protection, immune system protection, uh, muscle protection, uh, and the cholesterol optimization, besides the sexual. Now, after that, you know, 78-year-old and 80-year-old that I have, they don't have that much health benefits, but they get the symptomatic benefits because they feel energy, they sleep good, their memory is good, they perform good in the sex, and that's all they want. Now, I'm not going to be able to achieve the same health benefits for them because they're already like 30 years after the menopause. The whole destruction that hormone deficit caused in them, it's already happened. So I'm not a god to replace that. So it has to be done in a timely fashion. Timely fashion. To, for a full benefit. So first 10 years, you're getting everything. You're getting symptomatic relief and you're getting the long-term health benefits. After that, you're getting good symptomatic relief, partial health, long-term health benefits that are listed ma many times. Now, people who are before menopause, we replace testosterone. We don't replace estrogen and progesterone. And that's important because that gives them, regulates their menstrual cycles and gives them this symptomatic uh, improvement in their sexual performance, brain performance, bone protection, cardiovascular and cholesterol protection. For men, uh, we don't go to menopause. So at any age, you have a protective function. But again, if you lost it, there's an, a very interesting uh, um, uh, diagram or the graph that shows the levels of the testosterone 
and their corresponding protective function. At what levels, at different levels of testosterone, blood levels, they protect the different um, health functions. And that would start the highest level of testosterone needed for brain cognitive function protection and Alzheimer's so disease prevention. A little bit lower then it prevents your cardiovascular events and the strokes. You go and coming down a little bit lower, mood stabilization, anxiety, depression, a little bit lower, immune system stabilization. Stabilizing immune system meaning that you don't get exagger exaggerated immune response, for example, for COVID, right? Your immune system is not going to go berserk and destroy your own body. It kind of uh, brings the extremes of immune response to the middle normal. So that's the function of testosterone. A little bit lower, lower, close to 600, 700. Now you're going to feel the body aches and joint and muscle wasting prevention. You're coming a little bit lower and getting into the libido. Uh, so about 300 levels, level of total testosterone. 300 is when you feel the sexual dysfunction. So you see, by the time men comes to us, and tells me that you know he doesn't feel that sexual drive is as used to be, doesn't perform, his stamina is not as uh, good, he already lost all, because he already hit the 300 and below. He already lost all this protective, and who knows how many years it's been there. So those symptoms, they don't feel loss of protective function. So those hormones are protective. That's why it's important to give them that. Even though they don't have symptoms, they have a long-term health benefits. And there is a reason why 20 and 30 year old high, have high level testosterone in men and high level estrogen in women because they are protective. Prostate cancer doesn't happen to 30 year olds, doesn't happen to 40 year old. And the breast cancer is much rare in 20 and 30 year olds. Some subsets can happen in 30, 40. So all the, and the osteoporosis obviously doesn't happen in young because we are under the protection of the hormones. Once we hit 50 and 60 and lose that hormones, that protection goes away. That's when the breast cancer, prostate cancer, osteoporosis, cardiovascular events happen. So that's all the myths that they think that hormones create these problems is not true. I think it's important to educate uh, both men and women, but especially women uh, in these uh, protective, not just protective effects of hormone replacement therapy, but the fact that it can make life more pleasant and life doesn't they don't have to accept have to be dreary. They don't it have to accept status quo. It can be better. It yes. can be better. It they don't be have better. to accept feeling uh, all the symptoms at age 50, but not only women, men. There are hundreds of studies showing that men on testosterone have much lower risk of heart attacks, much lower risk of strokes, and lower chance of Alzheimer's. So, Yaakov, so, uh, a, let's say a 55-year-old or a 60-year-old man uh, comes to you and says, look, I look at my sons who are in their early 20s, and I used to be like that, and I want that back. And I am not as energetic. Uh, my muscle is wasting. I'm gaining weight. Um, I'm not as sharp as I used to be. Uh, and he says to you, look, I went to my urologist and I uh, uh, broached the subject of uh, testosterone replacement and my urologist yelled at me. He said, do you want to get prostate cancer? Do you want to get a heart attack? Do you want to get uh, uh, blood clots in your legs and lungs? Uh, do you want to get a stroke? So he scared the living daylights out of me and I said, no, 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 please, I don't want any of that. And obviously, you know, you, you know, I'm 60 years old. I can't be 25 anymore. I get that. But then I hear Dr. Levy talking about uh, testosterone replacement therapy. And there's still a part of me that wants to be younger, that wants to feel better, uh, that maybe, you know, maybe I can't be 25 again. But you know what? Maybe 35 wasn't that bad or 40 wasn't that bad. So why should I not be scared? Because you're telling me, don't be scared. The urologist is telling me, be scared. 
what do I do? I don't know what to do. Please here's help me. Do. Here's I'm what perplexed. It, here's what I'm do. confused. I have to tell you, check your urologist age. How old is your urologist? You have to ask. This is an old generation. This is an old information. Because I want to feel young again. Uh, yes. And Even then, 35 is he's good. He's scaring it's you incredible. because he's thinking about uh, synthetic testosterone, cyprionate, and I would not give it to you or to myself or to anybody else, synthetic testosterone. Single shot, a few shots of synthetic testosterone. Would you give that person pellet therapy? Absolutely, yeah. And I'll give it to your urologist to make him feel good. <laughs> and and how do you convince that patient that this is safe, despite what the urologist said? How do we convince them? So it's a, we give them a studies, we give them a actual... Uh, literature gave them actual uh, research and publications showing that difference between these are peer reviewed accepted yeah, peer -reviewed, studies. yes randomized placebo controlled showing benefits of bioidentical hormones compared to um, synthetic testosterone there's a distinct difference of their side effect profile distinct difference Testosterone cyprionate, yes, I wouldn't give to um, anyone without distinct medical indication, like purely just for symptoms, no. Because it destroys your testicles. Mm -hmm. It destroys your testicles, increases your cardiovascular risk. Blood clots may increase the prostate cancer. So it has a significant side effects. Completely different from bioidentical testosterone. Mm -hmm. Completely, completely different. They are multiple publications showing bioidentical testosterone benefit involving thousands of participants in Euro European studies. Mostly, these are mostly European studies and publications showing their benefits compared to the okay. synthetic testosterone. So okay. yes, would I take it in a heartbeat? Okay. Uh, and um, at what age should a man start to think about this? Should, be, should this be in his 40s, in his 50s, in his 60s? Should he wait until he feels like he's 100 years old before he considers something like this? Or should he at least consider this even when he still feels very strong and very powerful and, and very virile and very young? Interesting What's question. What's the right age? There is no direct correlation between the testosterone levels and the symptoms that you feel. There is a correlation between protective effects of testosterone levels and the long-term health benefits, but there is no correlation of testosterone blood levels with the symptoms. So if somebody comes, you might have somebody who has a testosterone level of 300 and no complaints. He's feeling good. His energy is okay. But you might have somebody who is testosterone levels 450 and he feels down, energy is not good, uh, memory is not as good, sexual performance not as good. So yes, number one factor to give them a, a replacement if somebody is symptomatic. If she comes or he comes and says that, hey, my energy level is not good, I don't sleep well, I'm not performing, my sexual drive is not good, my focus is not there. I cannot, you know, focus at work. So My you memory is not. Consider a man in his early forties. I would absolutely at, at thirty-five. You can start as early as thirty-five. Same for women. I can place testosterone as early as thirty-five, forty. And you don't necessarily look at their levels. I absolutely look at their levels. You do. Absolutely, I, I uh, palate replacement of bioidentical hormones. To calculate the dosage that needed, we take in account your age, size, weight, your symptoms, your medical history, and then blood levels. Mm -hmm. And we calculate the dose based on that. So yes, absolutely, we need to, not only testosterone, we also treat the thyroid. So we have to, thyroid is important. Thyroid, vitamin D is important hormones. Vitamin D is a hormone, I believe, it's not a supplement. So those, play important function on that. So those are all together into replacement. Okay. Uh, There's no age limits. Got it, no got it. Um, Dr. Levy, next question that I'd like to ask is, you know, when it comes to weight loss, um, there, you know, a lot of people, uh, but especially women, are concerned about loose skin. So loose skin following weight loss is something that's prominently seen after 
surgical weight loss. And I think the reason that happens is because with surgical weight loss, whether it's a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy or a gastric bypass, the weight loss, it's a very large amount of weight that is lost in a very short period of time. So with uh, surgical patients, uh, loose skin is something that's seen quite commonly. With our endoscopic procedures, it can happen, but it is unusual, but we do see it. Um, and I think the way I explain uh, the fact that it's, not, it's much more rare with our procedures is because our weight loss is more moderate and it's more gradual. So uh, a question that frequently comes up, uh, I understand that I can get, if I have a lot of loose skin, I can get a penulectomy, a penicolectomy, I apologize. And that's the uh, surgical removal of this excess skin. But a lot of people are afraid of surgery and then they say, are there any non-surgical, non-invasive ways to deal with loose skin? Please help us. So uh, surgical removal of the skin is um, important if you have an excessive of skin. Course, of course. So, uh, and the um, downside is um, it's a long surgery. Mm -hmm. It's very tedious surgery. Uh, has a significant infection risk, and it leaves a large scarring. Mm -hmm. It's usually large. It leaves a very big scar, whether it's abdominoplasty or brachioplasty or middle thighplasty. It leaves a pretty, pretty large, skin, a large uh, scarring. Unfortunately, there is no uh, radical effective method of reducing the loose skin uh, if it's really, really significantly a yeah, large amount of sense. the skin. That makes good sense. Because there are some subset of people that only surgery will help them. But there are some subset of people that have a minimal looseness that Let's they want to tighten it. Yes. Mild to moderate. Mild to moderate. You can do with a significant success energy-based devices. So that, what procedures that, do you specifically do? So we can patients? do either ultrasound or radiofrequency skin tightening. You can employ um, uh, microneedling, mm -hmm. deep microneedling. If you could explain some, some devices, what why these it works. methods are. Very briefly. Uh, briefly, so ultrasound mostly is a fat cavitation, so it's fat reduction, but at the same time, if you increase in the high powers in a prolonged time, it tightens the skin by stimulating the collagen production. So ultrasound. So do you have to destroy something first before you stimulate this collagen to no, perform? No, no, it's just a, a higher energy setups. Uh, so ultrasound we can apply for fat melting or skin tightening, depending mm -hmm. on the setup on the machine, uh, on the device. And it stimulates collagen production. It's a slow process, requires multiple sessions, and slowly, slowly induces collagen production in the skin turgor and the tightening occurs. A little bit more powerful would be radiofrequency. Radio frequency is a different way of delivering the energy. Ultrasound creates the oscillation of the fat and subdermal molecules and heats them up that way. Radio frequency directly delivers the waves that create the heat. So it's the two different modalities of delivering the heat. Both of them technically heat up the underlying tissue without damaging the skin. Right? Otherwise, we would put the iron <laughs> and heat the skin, but we would burn the whole skin on the way down to the subdermis. So this is the ways of delivering heat, passing the skin without damaging the skin and creating heat underneath. So it's actually amazing technology if you think about it, delivering the heat, passing the skin inside mm -hmm. the tissue. Next method will be microneedling. What is microneedling? Microneedling, we basically creating the micro traumas through the skin, going through the dermis and so inside. You make holes, multiple holes. Multiple uh, needles. And it's like a stems. It has like a depending 24 or 16 needles and it stems. Mm -hmm. uh, and radio frequency microneedling. So it delivers the needles and the radio frequency stimulation at the same time, creates the collagen and uh, tightens the skin. Now, the, uh, those probably would be the, or uh, there is also a J plasma, not a big favorite of that. You have to do a two mass and anesthesia. You have to go inside and tighten the skin. Uh, significant side effects. Um, you can do laser, you can do cool laser, or you can do CO2 laser to stimulate the collagen uh, production. What we do, I do ultrasound, radio frequency, uh, microneedling, uh, and radio frequency the other way, uh, in more invasive way of delivering radio frequency. It tightens the skin and relieves also stretch marks that created by the weight loss or increased weight. Uh, 
but there is a limit of how much you can do with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have to have an appropriate expectations. Sure. No, of course, as with every procedure. Uh, how about a man that has a tire around his, underneath his belly? Can any of your non-invasive procedures help in any way? Or do you actually have to resort to something much more invasive? You need more invasive. More invasive. Yes, tire underneath the belly. It's a significant amount of the skin, mm -hmm. significant amount of the defect uh, on the fascia. So you have to uh, remove the skin. You have to placate the fascia underneath to support it. Otherwise, it's not going to resolve. So, so there are no miracles in life? Unfortunately, okay. yes. No, All right. No, no miracles. I mean, you have to have an appropriate procedure for each uh, uh, condition if you want to achieve the goals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I know we touched on this briefly, but I just want to come back. Uh, besides the, uh, that wonderful orgasmic injections that you do, uh, what is another one of your favorite pelvic gynecologic uh, uh, cosmetic procedures? That you love. Uh, that because I love. Because you great results. Great results. Um, few. Okay. One would be um, that in my practice, I see good results for premenopausal or postmenopausal women would be a vaginal laser resurfacing. What exactly Simple. is Simple. So we basically go inside the vagina and treat the whole surface of the vagina with a laser. With so a essentially CO2. you're burning the well, We're not burning because of the it's a micro, it's like a micron uh, beams, laser beams, 81 beams that creating that uh, tiny holes through the mucosa. Okay. Laser has a unique ability of stimulating the uh, neovascularization. You uh, induce so inflammation. You induce, induce inflammation. Tissue damage. And then you resurface this um, mucosa, so it grows the healthy new mucosa. You stimulate the circulation. You improve the sensation. You improve the moisturization, so you relieve the dryness. So it relieves dryness, improves the urinary continence. It goes through almost close the uh, bladder neck and the urethra, so it strengthens the urethra walls, vaginal walls. So you achieving the strengthening vaginal walls, strengthening urethra walls and bladder neck, so relieving the urinary incontinence, so when they cough, sneeze, and lose urine, no more. Relieves the dryness for postmenopausal women, very important, so they don't have dryness, especially women who have a breast cancer and mm -hmm. cannot take hormones because of that. They are left with nothing, so they cannot have sex, they are dry. This one is like a guts sign for them because it improves the um, moisturization and then relieves the dryness. That's incredible. It um, does. I mean, uh, the analogous procedure uh, with what we do, um, uh, endoscopically, something called uh, duodenal uh, resurfacing. Oh, uh, and essentially, this procedure is ideal for patients who have diabetes. Wow. Uh, and what this procedure does is it mimics the effects of a gastric bypass. So, uh, one of the um, uh, amazing things that we felt or that the bariatric surgeons came up with is what they realize is that when they do a gastric bypass, the diabetes is improved much, much sooner, uh, and you can't uh, attribute this improvement in diabetic parameters based on the weight loss because the weight loss hasn't happened yet. Yet, and the diabetes yet. already improved. And the diabetes has already improved, and the thinking was that. The reason the diabetes is improved is because the proximal duodenum, or the first part of the small intestine, has been bypassed. And the thinking is that a lot of the insulin resistance lies in the lining of that first part of the small intestine, which is somehow defective. So we now have procedures, and this is called uh, duodenal uh, resurfacing, where we can actually get either a heater probe or a laser into, into the duodenum. We essentially burn off the lining of the uh, first part of the small intestine. It looks awful when, when we you do, do it. It looks scary. But then when you come back a month later, everything has healed. Wow. And their diabetic parameters improve 
significantly. So a lot of what you're describing, I think, is analogous to I what know, we're just... trying to do. And I think that in the very, very near future, this will be one of the procedures that we do, for diabetes. especially for patients, for diabetic patients who are overweight. For who, type 2 diabetes. Uh, sorry, sorry. For any kind of even, diabetes, even type including type 1. And essentially what we would do for these uh, patients is we would do a stomach procedure, which is the suture sculpt or the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. We do that for the weight loss, and then we would do the duodenal resurfacing to improve their diabetic parameters in a way that would be additive to what the weight, the loss. weight loss gives yes. you. So what you're describing is amazing. It's, a, it's amazing that body responds in the same Absolutely. way to the same modality, energy-based devices, you basically stimulation. You create new lining, right. and that you new lining... You functions, you basically triggering right. body to start regenerative uh, function in that area. That's, so that's amazing. Uh, that's, that's really uh, uh, amazing. One more procedure that you love, that uh, uh, really uh, gives amazing... I mean, we do... You uh, tell me, you t whatever you like that gives people really wonderful results. Wonderful yeah. results. I mean... It doesn't have to be pelvic. It doesn't have to be. Uh, we do a lot of body contouring. Uh, Tell us about that, please. Uh, body contouring is um, uh, my patients, the thousands of patients that I delivered or the, over the ages have been with me. Uh, they, um, with age, became very uncomfortable with, with, with their body of course. Uh, shape, and I started introducing these pr uh, procedures. Is this and instead I, of the mommy makeover? Well, How is it different? What, what, what is mommy makeover? Mommy makeover is like a term that uh, some uh, uh, OBGYN came up uh, in. Uh, oh, it was South. not a plastic surgeon. It was an OBGYN. No OBGYN. Okay, actually. okay. Tell me. <laughs> came up, and it's a combination of few things: combination of vaginoplasty, and I do a plastic surgery for vagina to make it uh, tighter, tighter. Mm -hmm. uh, labioplasty if they need it to trim or uh, reshape the labias to. And that makes it more sensitive. And more no, responsive. it makes it aesthetically different. Aesthetically. And also some women with age, the labia gets bigger or mm -hmm. they have a different shape and it's uncomfortable for them to wear, you know, tight jeans or even the swimming uh, suit. So they want to trim the labia and then we do a trimming of labia and add to that all this laser vaginal resurfacing or injections or uh, orgasm enhancing uh, injections with PRP or exosomes or the autologous fat and add to that liposuction. Mm -hmm. Mommy makeover would be liposuction of the abdomen or uh, flanks or so-called love handles, lower backs or bra lines. These are lines where with pregnancy accumulate excessive fat. So we don't jump into right after pregnancy. We'll let them lose weight, wait at least a year and make sure they don't have, they are done with their childbearing, they're not planning to get pregnant again and destroy our results. <laughs> mm, so once they're done and they're not planning to have right, kids anymore, course. we can do makeover. So there's a combination of total makeover. You do abdominal and uh, uh, side uh, liposuction combined with uh, if they need, you know, everybody mm -hmm. has a different needs, lower back or bra line or upper back liposuction, if they need the middle thigh liposuction and combined with the pelvic uh, plastic surgery would be vaginal tightening, Mm -hmm. or labioplasty. So some people may need all, some people may need less. Do you have a BMI cutoff? For liposuction, yes. Yeah. So what is your cutoff? I would say 32. 32. 32. For, uh, again, you can do liposuction higher, but you're not going to have a good results. Right. Because those people, above 32, now you're a candidate for more like abdominoplasty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So com combined liposuction with abdominal, because you're going to have excessive skin that you want to address. So a, a lot of women, what I find is when they want to lose weight, they resort to procedures such as an abdominoplasty or a tummy tuck or lipo to lose the weight, and then they're not thrilled with the results. And what I try to tell them is that... Um, those procedures are not really meant for weight loss. Absolutely. Uh, I think that it's important in order to optimize the results of those procedures, you want to lose the weight first, so do some kind of a weight loss procedure first, and then you use uh, those procedures, whether it's the abdominoplasty or the liposuction, to give shape, to contour, to, uh, to sculpt Absolutely. Uh, this is, your yeah. body. Absolutely. This is the number one rule. So when somebody comes and wants a liposuction, I tell them, could you please try to lose weight? 
uh, and have you been trying to lose weight and is this the bottom is this that's it end of the road if you, you try to lose the weight and that's it you cannot lose any more weight then yes then we can try to reshape reshape your body so first they have to lose the weight that's the key point liposuction by no means it's not a weight losing uh, procedure you can just imagine we remove maybe a couple liters of fat right two liters maybe two and a half liters in aggressive uh, in extensive um, I mean there are some cases that you can remove way more than that but I think average would be between 1500 to 2500 uh, cc's of fat now this is this is like um, uh, six seven pounds of uh, weight so seven pounds of weight cannot give you adequate weight loss perception right so this is basically reshaping procedure it's a sculpting right. procedure so right. we are creating the perception of the shape so you have to already lose the weight and then removing the fat with the liposuction in certain areas that are visible we give it a shape, the shape so it's the not shape. weight losing right. it's right. not the waist adjusting you know the size right. of the weights no it is reshaping that's why it's called body contouring right. body reshaping so definitely absolutely right you're right you have to tell them to lose weight first by any means whatever means it is um, uh, suture scoped or endoscopic uh, balloon or whatever method they decide or appropriate to decide and then at the end of the road come of the other issue uh, that comes up very frequently is uh, many women who opt uh, procedures such as abdominoplasty or tummy tucks or liposuction for weight loss. Uh, what they don't realize is that uh, those procedures only remove the peripheral fat. Peripheral fat is not what's responsible for the deleterious effects of fat. What are the bad effects of fat? It predisposes you to diabetes, to high blood pressure, to heart disease. It destroys your liver. It destroys your heart uh, with sleep apnea. So the, um, the fat that gives you those bad results is the visceral fat. That's the fat that surrounds uh, the main organs in the body. And if you want to have health benefits from weight loss, what you need to lose is the visceral fat and not the peripheral fat. And um, that's something that many, many, many people unfortunately uh, overlook. Overlook or uh, they don't want to accept it because I have a lot of people come in and telling me oh, I want to have a liposuction. And I look at them and I see that their visceral fat is more prominent than peripheral fat. And I tell them, I'm not going to do liposuction because you're not going to have a good results, number one, because it's not a weight lossing procedure. Number two, if we take the peripheral fat, that little peripheral fat that you have, your visceral fat will become more prominent and more unsightly. And the number three, you're not going to get any health benefits from that. Yeah. So yeah. the Thank first you. thing I tell them, you have to go back and uh, talk to um, your doctor about weight loss whether it's surgical, non-surgical, or any procedure that get rid of the visceral fat and see how much is left and then we can talk, yeah. then we can talk. So that's, a lot of people overlook that I agree. or don't accept it or no, they no. don't want to take I it. I agree. And, and the reason they overlook it, I think it's because uh, to lose weight, it's harder. It's much harder, yeah. regardless of which method you use, whether it's a surgical method, whether it's an endoscopic method, or whether it's medical weight loss management, uh, it's hard. Whereas to do a tummy tuck or liposuction is relatively much, much easier. And you see the results much faster. Right away. So, uh, you know, it, it's just easier. It's, it's just easier. easier. People want the easy but uh, wrong. I agree. I easier agree. but wrong. So <laughs> we, we shouldn't resort to that uh, procedure. Dr. Levy, thank you for spending some time with us. Uh, I've enjoyed this tremendously. I learned a lot from you, as I always do. And I think uh, all of our patients who are going to tune into this podcast are also going to learn a lot from you. And I think that the uh, topics that you've uh, touched on today and what you've taught us today is going to help many, many people, both men and women, with improving their lives and making their lives more pleasant and more enjoyable. So just getting uh, just the fact that we're getting older doesn't mean that we have to be miserable. We can still get older, age gracefully, 
and be happy and enjoy the things that we enjoyed in our youth, in our 20s, 30s, and 40s. Just because you're 50 or 60 doesn't mean that your life is over. Absolutely. Nowadays, people are living longer and longer. The life expectancy is increasing. Mm -hmm. And anything that we can do to improve the enjoyment of our lives, uh, I think is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure to being here, being with you. And I hope uh, it was a little bit uh, useful. And I hope uh, uh, your patients find it uh, useful oh, I know they and will. Uh, education. I'll be happy to come back and touch down on so many topics that we can talk about. I will about. demand that you come back very, very soon. Uh, with pleasure. And if uh, your patients, your audience wants to reach out to us and find out more about our procedures, they can uh, reach us on the phone numbers that we put up on the screen or which is um, on our Instagram which is drlevy underscore obgyn.com. Okay.